Chapter seven in our NASM seventh edition personal training certification textbook. And chapter seven, you probably want to hold on to your seats because here's where we get into human movement science. And I'm just going to uh, give you a little prelim. Um, once we start into talking about human movement, uh, kinesiology, biomechanics, things like that, what we're really doing or what NASM is really doing is kind of prepping you to get an appreciation and understanding of how their OPT model is uh, or where it's coming from and why they, why they put it together the way they did. Well, this is all preliminary information to help you understand why it's going to look the way it looks. And just real quick, the, the, the idea is that a progressive system should start with the understanding that people have a certain level of capability to do certain things with their cardiovascular and their muscular system. So we have to progress people to higher and higher levels of, of physical capability, if you want to think of it like that. Well, um, understanding how the human movement system works, functions, what are the variables related to getting it to be better, right, at what it does, um, is going to be a, a preliminary base of information that will now allow you to understand why the, why the optimum performance training system uh, can be really effective at helping people navigate and move through these different levels, levels of physical capability. So chapter seven starts with the human movement system. And again, right off the bat, keep in mind, um, you're going to need a you know good amount of paper to memorize to memorize and write down some of the terms because once again when we're when we're in this venue of fitness and wellness um, there's an underlying vocabulary <clears throat> that you have to have to be able to to be able to move through these uh, more uh, more complicated more complicated concepts and ultimately into a progressive system of training. So you got to have these terms um, pretty well defined. One of the reasons why we see folks having challenges with the materials is because they don't have the basis. It's kind of like trying to do calculus without having a good foundation in arithmetic and trigonometry and geometry, for instance. <clears throat> so you have to have some basic information pretty well down. And that's what they're doing is they're giving you this opportunity to spend some time particularly in chapter seven, to, to look at, understand, and deal with the, the terms and the concepts in, the, in what's called the HMS, or the Human Movement System. So remember, slow it down, take your time writing, right, writing down the terms, trying to memorize, and, and what I want to do here is help you with the concepts more than anything. So I'll be kind of jumping through past things that I know have given and continue to give people, students, a little bit of a challenge. Um, because again, it's it's um, conceptually, there's a three-dimensionality, of course, to the human movement system that can be a little bit a little bit challenging uh, to, uh, to understand. So that's what I want to go through you. And chapter seven, which starts on page uh, 189, just gives you a basic introduction to human movement science. And we've said it before that the, that the human movement system has the three components, which is the musculoskeletal and the nervous system, right? We went over those in the previous chapters. <clears throat> that all collectively forms what is known as the HMS or the human movement system. It's a concept, it's conceptual, right? So the human movement system is these three actual physical, physical components systems of the body that when they all come together are allow for uh, human movement. And there are problems that can occur that arise from dysfunctions. And that's what we're going to get to at the end of the chapter. So first thing we have to understand is some basic uh, biomechanics and terminology and what's known as um, the anatomic location. So on, um, on page 190, uh, 191, you have table Seven. I would look. I would just go ahead and I'll give you. I'll give you a little bit of assistance here with some of these locations. So medial, middle, medial, right, um, relatively close to the midline of the body, right. An example are the adductors, the inner thigh. Those are medial, 
right? Because they're closer to what's called the midline of the body. Medial also uh, can refer to a type of movement like an internal rotation or medial rotation. So medial and its opposite is lateral. So on the outside or a movement, rotational movement outward. So, and again, the term relatively. So when you see medial this or lateral this, they are, they are the opposite, right? Medial relatively close to the midline, lateral relatively further away. <clears throat> uh, contralateral positioned on the opposite side. So we talk about uh, exercises and you may have even done these or seen these contralateral supermen, we call them, right? Where you're on your hands and knees and you lift your left arm out and your right leg up and back, right? We call those contralateral supermen, really cool term. Uh, but that's what contralateral means, contralateral, right? So on opposite sides, of the body, ipsa lateral again, uh, positioned on the same side. So you can you can look at the examples here on table seven one anterior, front posterior on the back, proximal right is uh, positioned uh, nearest to the center of the body or other what's called identified reference point. So proximal closer right. Um, you'll notice the difference between medial and proximal. Medial, don't confuse them. Medial is relatively closer. Proximal means literally closer, right? So my shoulder is proximal, right, in relation to my hand, right? Because my shoulder is literally closer to the midline of the body than my hand is. And so proximal versus distal. Distal is literally further away from the midline. So my hand is more distal than my shoulder. My hand is more distal than my elbow because my elbow, right? If I crack up you know, my limb right here, my upper arm, my elbow is closer to the midline of the body, closer than my wrist, which is closer than my fingers. So distal, proximal, medial, lateral, these are terms that you got to kind of, because if they're, they're really kind of three-dimensional. Um, and so you got to keep that in mind. Inferior, superior, um, these simply mean below a structure of the body or above or on top of. So the um, um, superior aspect of the scapula, the superior aspect of the uh, of the hip or the pelvis, right? So uh, position above or position below. You gotta get these terms down. Again, you write them over and over and then just kind of, you know, play a little game. What, look at look at your knee. Is your knee uh, more proximal than your, than your hip? Or is your knee more distal than your hip? Is your ankle, right? You can do that. Once you get that down, that's gonna be, that's gonna be very helpful. Of course, figure seven two is, is gonna help you a lot. Also planes of motion, this is, this again, one of those areas where, where it can be a little confusing because not only of the terms, but of this three dimensionality that we have to kind of think of. And so the, um, the planes of motion, um, there's, there's three planes of motion, right? We live in a three dimensional, I guess you can say four dimension with time, but we're not, we're talking about space, not time and space. So there's, um, there's three planes that you have to memorize in the terms that go along with them. They are the sagittal, frontal, and transverse planes. Let me see if I can help you here with this. Um, any movement that occurs is going to occur in three dimensions. So we want to be able to define, right, define those movement patterns and use terms that, um, that are associated with those particular planes. Now, look, if you look at figure 7-4, if you can figure this out and you got it and you know that movements front and back, right, and then movements side to side are the sagittal and the frontal plane, uh, rotational movements, right? Rotational movements like this are in the transverse plane, then great. But some folks have a challenge with that. And so let me, let me kind of help you with this. A sagittal plane is, a, is an imaginary plane that bisects the body into a left and a right half. And that's what you see in the drawing. So any movement, you kind of think of it like this or at least this is what helped me and it has helped some folks. If I have an imaginary plane, I'm using these sheets of paper um, to, to define that imaginary plane. It 
it bisects, so I'm going to put it like this in front of me, it bisects the body into a right and a left half, right? A left and a right half. So this is imaginary, right? So it cuts me straight down the middle. Imagine any type of movement that kind of rubs against this imaginary plane, right? So if I move my hand back and forth, that's against the plane. So now you can imagine any movements, and I like to use the concept of a soldier marching. So a soldier marches right straight ahead. Hand goes in front, hand goes behind. There's no movement to the side. There's no rotational movement. Everything, imagine, imagine um, two walls have closed in on you from the side, right? Or you go up against the wall on one side and then another imaginary wall comes up against you like this, okay? So I'll back up a little bit. And imagine that you are crushed in and you can't move any other way than like this. Right? I can only I can't move my hands out and I can't move my head to the side and I can't even turn my head, right? Just you got to imagine. Only movements that I can make are I can lean forward and I can lean back. My arms can go forward, my elbows can bend this way, right? So this is all movement in the sagittal plane. Uh, the terms that we use to describe sagittal planar motion are flexion and extension which occurs at a, you know, at joints, right? And flexion um, is defined as the angle between two joints decreasing. Extension at a joint is defined as the angle of the joint increasing, right? So flexion and extension, if you think of my elbow, right? It extends the angle between the two bones. If you think about this angle right here, this is 180 degrees, right? It's a straight line across. So this angle here, go back to high school, high school geometry, the 180 degrees. If I do this, I have just flexed my elbow, right? That's called flexion. Well, what is the angle now? It's 90 degrees. So 180 to 90 degrees, that's called flexion. If I do the opposite, the opposite of flexion is extension. It increases the angle between the two, the two body segments or between the joint. And so Sagittal plane, got to keep this in mind. It's a good idea when you when you study and write this down, you write sagittal plane, flexion and extension. Okay. Other terms we use in the sagittal plane are going to be uh, plantar flexion, which is movement at the ankle, right? That's where your toe points down. And dorsiflexion is when the toe points back up. But remember, the ankle moves in line, right, um, with flexion and extension. We just have different just different terms that we use for it, okay? Um, so, so let's see, you've got flexion, extension, you've got plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, right? And so anytime you see this movement, it's the name of the joint and then whether it's flexion, extension. So if I, if I, um, um, if I bend at the waist, that's going to be hip flexion. When I stand back up, right, from movement at the waist, it's hip extension. And so when you go through this chapter, just kind of keep that in mind. Look at all the joints. It's not like you have a thousand joints you got to worry about. It's basically your elbow, your wrist, your shoulder, your hips, your pelvis, spinal column, knees, and ankles. Okay, so with that said, you can, you can memorize these fairly easy. Movement in the frontal plane. Now imagine in the frontal plane, it's an imaginary plane that does not bisect me left and right, but bisects me front and back. So now if you can imagine, right, a plane that bisects me front and back, and that's what that figure is showing you. Well, imagine, again, this is the way to kind of think about this, is you think about walking up to a wall, right? You walk up to a wall and you put your face up against it, you put your body up against it, and then an imaginary wall comes behind you and sandwiches you. So now your hands are at your sides, right? And you're squeezed front and back by these two walls. Well, what's the only movement you can make? You can't move your hands in front anymore. You can't move your hands behind. You can't do the sagittal plane stuff, can you? You can only move your arms out. You can only move your head side to side. You can't even twist your head like that, right? You can only move your arms up and out to the side, move your legs up and out to the side, um, the only thing you can do is lift your shoulders, right? 
you can lift, you can shrug and go back down, right? And that's gonna tell you a couple of terms that we that we use. So movements that you need to know in the, in the frontal plane are what are known as abduction or abduction and adduction or adduction. So normally the way we do it is we say abduction or abduction. So ab and ad, abduction or abduction and adduction, add. And so that's a way to remember adduction is because um, abduction and adduction at the shoulder, for instance, okay? Abduction is movement away from the midline of the body. So if I lift my arms out to the sides, like you're doing a lateral raise, you grab 25 on the, and you do a lateral raise. Well, that movement up and out is called abduction or abduction, okay? Now, a way to remember adduction is simply add, add the arm or the hand back down to your side. Again, that's just helpful, helpful ways to think about memorization. So adduction or adduction is adding the hand back down to the side. So those movements, abduction and adduction are within the frontal plane. Um, at the shoulder girdle, we write the movement of the, sh of the shoulder girdle, right? The scapula, the scapula can move up and move down. And so we call that elevation and depression. Okay, so elevation, shrugging, right? You shrug. And then when you let it back down, that's called scapular depression. And so those are those are terms that occur in the in the frontal in the frontal plane. In the transverse plane, we have what's known as internal external rotation, right? And uh, basically you're, you're only gonna see this a lot with the hands, right? So the head and the torso twisting from side to side. So um, transverse plane movements is an imaginary plane. It's an imaginary plane that, that bisects the body into a top and a lower, a um, superior and inferior uh, partition, right? So anything that rotates and, and here's some of the definitions, medial and lateral rotation, okay? So lateral rotation is movement, right? Where there's rotation movement away from the midline of the body. Medial rotation at the limbs, for instance, is movement rotation towards the in, um, in midline of the body. A couple of other terms that we use, and you probably know these, would be supination and pronation, these are special terms used to describe rotation at the wrist, right? Supination is lateral, lateral rotation, right? See, outward rotation, see my thumb moves out. So supination, like when you're doing a dumbbell curl, you curl up and you supinate this way. So that's called supination. Now, again, a way to remember it is if you were to give somebody a bowl of soup, I didn't make it up. I just heard it probably about 50 years ago. If you were going to give somebody a bowl of soup, how would you hand it to them? You would hand it to them like this. You would put the bowl of soup, palm up, right? So supination is give somebody a bowl of soup. I don't know what you say about pronation, except that it's the opposite, right? So it's just going to be pronation like this. Um, these are terms that are important to know because they're used all the time when you're training, when you're training people and doing doing exercises, so that should help you understand planar planar motion. There's any number of figures that that you have available to look at. Um, the next uh, the next area, scapular rotation. Of course, the next area that we want to go into is the um, muscle actions themselves, and you got a number of side <clears throat> definitions that you want to want to definitely know. Um, muscle muscle actions, meaning um, isotonic, isometric, and isokinetic movements. The ones that we want to know that really are important for us as trainers are the isotonic and isometric <clears throat> isometric movements. Iso means same. Okay, um, so isometric, metric means length. So same length. So an isometric contraction simply means that the muscle is under tension, but it's not changing length. We do that when we do a, a wall sit. If you've ever done squats or it's leg day, right? 
<clears throat> and you have your clients or you you go up against the wall and you just sit there, right? And you hold it, right? Or you're holding a med ball or whatever. And your quads are under a lot of tension, but they're not changing length. Like when you do a squat, when you do a squat, right? Your muscles are shortening and lengthening. Isometric contractions are those contractions where the muscles under tension, but there's no, there's no active lengthening or shortening of the muscle. Um, isotonic uh, means that we have concentric and eccentric. So the two, the, the two muscle contractions <clears throat> that we know that we talk about normally in, in exercise science are eccentric and concentric contractions. Those are both what are termed isotonic, right? So we have isometric, concentric, and eccentric contractions. Concentric contractions is when the uh, is when the muscle is shortening under tension, right? It's the muscle is able to overcome whatever the resistance is. So it's when the bicep shortens, and when it shortens, it's able to overcome the resistance, right? There's enough power force generation to shorten and overcome the resistance. That's a concentric contraction. Eccentric contractions are just the opposite. It's when um, the muscle is lengthening under tension. But remember, if I'm lengthening and allowing the weight to go down, it's basically controlling the movement of it. It's not dropping. I'm using muscular power and force to slow and control the movement of the resistance downward. So isometric, no movement, right? Concentric, shortening, eccentric, Lengthening. Those are your basic type of muscle actions that you got on page uh, one one ninety nine, <clears throat> and and you'll get a better explanation. Isokinetic. Um, isokinetic simply means that, uh, and you got to use a machine for this so that it's the same speed of movement. The tension can change, and you really can only perform these on isokinetic machines. But the term is important to know. So iso same. Um, same speed. So these machines will only move at a certain speed. So as much as you're pulling, right, um, it'll only move at a, at a specific rate. Um, and by the way, isotonic, as I mentioned before, isotonic means um, that it's going to be the same tension development. So not the same speed. You can actually increase the speed at which your limb moves with an, iso, with an isotonic. Isokinetic means that you got to use a machine and it forces you to move at one speed. And um, so that's isokinetic. Muscle action spectrum simply describes the full, the full range of the uh, concentric isometric and eccentric or concentric isometric um, uh, muscle contractions uh, for a particular movement. So, so that's, that's a definition of muscle action uh, spectrum, and they give you a, uh, an explanation of that. Now we move into, on page 203, functional anatomy of muscles. And here's, here's a couple of really, really important terms that you, that you wanna get down. Um, the concept of muscles as movers, and that's really important that you, that you get this idea. Muscles do these things called contracting, right? They contract and then they lengthen. And because they're able to do that, they're able to move the limbs and and over the joints and move and move limbs and therefore create create motion and movement. So muscles as movers. Key terms here: agonists, synergists, stabilizers, and antagonists. Why is this important? Because now we're getting into the real world of what happens when you have problems or issues with your muscles, right? An agonist, a agonist is the primary mover or the muscle is the primary muscle mover for a particular movement, whatever that pattern is. So the agonist is the prime primary um, actor in that particular movement, right? So the biceps are the agonist in elbow flexion, okay? So when you're doing a dumbbell curl, it's not your, it's not your brachioradialis, and it's not your brachialis, right? It's your biceps brachii is the primary, um, is the primary flexor, right, at the elbow for this particular movement. Now, don't get me wrong. The uh, brachialis is a is a very powerful elbow flexor, um, and it does work synergistically with the biceps brachii. So a synergist is a muscle that helps the prime mover do whatever it is. It's supposed to be doing. 
here's the thing and why this is so important. Your agonist is supposed to be the primary mover at the joint. Your synergist is not meant to be the primary mover. And you're going to realize this more when you when you when we move into these um, further chapters. And this is why this is critical to get this right now, because if you know what the primary mover, what the agonist is for a movement, and you know that the synergists are, you can see if there's uh, dysfunction going on. And uh, we see this all the time. Know this, and a lot of the rest of the textbook becomes a lot easier and um, and more and more um, um, understandable. Agonist, primary mover, synergist, they help with the movement. They help with the movement. They're not the primary mover, but they do assist and help. Stabilizers are those muscles that normally maintain isometric contractions, right? No movement. Remember, stabilizers hold other areas of the body in place while the agonist does its thing. So when I'm doing it, when I'm standing and doing a barbell curl, um, if my lower back and my pelvis and muscles all in and around the core of my core of my body, if those areas are not isometrically contracting and holding everything in place, I could not do this movement. Because as soon as I lifted the bar up in front of me, my entire body would lean forward. But thank goodness my erector spinae and other muscles in that area are isometrically contracting to hold my torso in place. That's what stabilizers do. Antagonists are the opposite or the opposing muscle to the agonist. It's, it's a perfect term, antagonistic. If I'm antagonistic towards you, I'm going against you. Well, in the case of the biceps working over the elbow, my biceps are the agonist, the primary mover in elbow flexion. My triceps are the antagonist, meaning that they do the opposite movement. One flexes, one extends. So that's what the antagonist is. Um, that's the definition of the antagonist. Why is it this important? Um, because now, now you're going to have to uh, kind of understand why one muscle needs to relax while the other contracts. And if there's dysfunction or there's imbalances, there's um, issues related to um, how the muscles are not functioning properly with each other in sync, um, this, is where, this is where people have problems with, um, with their musculoskeletal system. The HMS gets thrown out of whack and we see problems and issues that for the most part, um, you can help, but you got to be able to know them. And this is why knowing this is critical. So as we move on to page 204, open versus closed kinetic chain movements, this is fairly straightforward in that a kinetic chain is simply the collection of all the limbs and joints in a particular movement. Um, again, we'll use a, use a simple example of doing a lateral raise, right? So a lateral raise, right? Shoulder abduction and abduction, right? So you sit there and you do up, right? So if I lift my arm up and out to the side, what are the joints and limbs that are involved directly with that movement? Well, it's not my legs and feet, is it? No, of course not. It's my shoulder joint, my scapulohumeral joint, right? The scapula, the humeral joint, the, the um, upper arm, the elbow, the forearm, the wrist, and the hands. So if you think about it, those are the parts of my body that are involved with movement. My head's not involved. Now, are the muscles in my neck? Yeah, of course. However, the, the movement itself, what we call the kinetic chain. So the kinetic movement, kinetics, right? Movement, the movement chain, that, that collection of all the different parts of that movement pattern, right? So it's gonna be my arm, my hand, even my fingers holding the dumbbells. So the kinetic chain is defined by all of those limbs. Well, if I move my hand, right? And my hand is moving in time and space in relation to my shoulder joint, which is not moving other than the rotational and movement of my scapula. If my hand is moving, that is the distal component of the kinetic chain. The part closer to the midline of the body is the proximal component, right? So if I'm, my hand is out here and I'm lifting up a dumbbell, that's the distal, the distance. Well, we think about distance. So the distal is the part furthest away from the midline. And then the proximal, which would be like the shoulder and the glenohumeral, 
uh, joint. So all of the, those are closer to the midline of the body, which makes them proximal. Remember, we went over that with the table. So what's the difference between a closed and an open kinetic chain uh, movement? Well, it's very simple. If the distal component of the chain, the kinetic chain is moving with respect to a stationary proximal, distal moves, proximal stationary, we have what's known as an open chain movement. A closed chain movement is the exact opposite. It's when the distal is fixed, like I'm holding onto a bar, right? Well, let's let's do a pull-up, right? If I'm doing a pull-up, right? And I hold onto a bar, which is fixed, it doesn't move, and I pull myself up and down. Now you'll notice that the proximal part of that chain, right? Because I'm pulling myself up. The proximal is moving, but the distal is stationary. Go ahead and think about some exercises and whether they are open or closed kinetic chain. I'll give you a real, real simple way to think about this. If your feet or your hands are moving and your body is stationary, it's an open chain movement. If your hands or your feet and you're doing some exercise, if your hands and your feet are not moving, but your torso is moving and your body is moving, probably closed chain. Squats are a closed chain exercise. Push-ups are a closed chain exercise. Why? Because my hands aren't moving, but my torso is. Open and closed uh, kinetic chain movements. That's, that's one of the best ways, I think, to kind of get the idea for this. So now we move into what's known as muscular force, and then a very important concept called length tension relationship. It's basically based on the uh, based on the reality that every muscle in your body has a ideal resting length where you have maximal overlap of the actin and myosin. See why it's important to know some of your anatomy? Maximum overlapping of the actin and myosin filaments ensures that there's maximum force production at that particular length. That's what that means. So the length tension relationship says that if a muscle is lengthened beyond that ideal length, or if it's shortened beyond that ideal length, you're gonna lose power or force or tension development uh, capabilities. Again, look at, look at figure 715. You know, I, I sort of, again, I was always confused by some of these charts. These are classic, these are classic uh, charts right here, figures. They've been around for a long time. I used to get confused by these until I started to kind of think about it in the real world. What you're seeing here is a is a uh, two sarcomeres, right? Actin and myosin. And uh, basically what it's saying is that as the, um, as that, um, what really is the muscle, the length of the muscle, but this is at this cellu the cellular level, um, as it lengthens or shortens the ability of the, the ability of the muscle to generate force either goes down or goes up. And so the uh, length tension relationship basically says that um, there's an ideal length that the muscle is under, right? An ideal length that when the muscle is at that particular length, it has maximum tension development. And that's what the length tension relationship is talking about. It's based on the overlap of actin and myosin filaments in the sarcomere. Um, you know, as you move, as you lengthen the sarcomere, the, remember, there's an overlap of actin and myosin filaments. And as you reduce the total number of, of, um, of actual uh, connections that can be made between the actin and the myosin, right, what we call cross bridges, as you reduce that, you reduce the ability of the muscle, of that muscle, that sarcomere to develop tension and the same thing goes with shortening. So, so that's, um, that's, a basic, that's a basic concept, but how does that now lead us to, to more real world scenarios? And this is it, it's called the altered length tension relationship. So when it's altered, right, um, what we start to see are what we call muscle imbalances, right? So muscles on either side of a joint, like your biceps and your triceps, have under ideal, ideal conditions, um, different, their lengths are ideal, right? So if I let my arm hang at my side, the length of my bicep and the length of my tricep muscles are or should be in these ideal length tension relationships. Now, if for some reason, one of those muscles becomes 
altered in its length tension relationship, that's going to cause a that's going to cause a sort of dysfunctional pattern at the joint. And so the idea with with altered with this altered length tension relationship concept is that if I sit for extended periods of time, if I keep my if my arm is in a cast, great example, for a long period of time, weeks and weeks, what ends up happening is the muscles, the muscles that work that are over surrounding those joints will either shorten and remain shortened or lengthen. And when they remain lengthened over extended periods of time or they remain shortened, um, their length tension relationship becomes altered, dysfunctional. The muscle is no longer able to uh, maintain or produce high levels of tension because it's been shortened over extended period of time or lengthened. If that happens to one muscle, it alters the other muscle at the bicep. If, if for whatever reason, my bicep is shortened for an extended period of time, it's going to lengthen my tricep. My tricep doesn't want to stay lengthened like that, right? It wants to be in a normal length tension relationship. And this is where, this is where we get this concept of muscle imbalances. I'm not saying that it happens at the elbow. Normally, when it does happen at the elbow, it's because of a cast. Okay, that's where we see it all the time. Now we see obvious muscle atrophy, but there's also this problem that occurs because now the tricep is lengthened, the bicep is shortened, and it's got to go to physical therapy. The normal, quote, normal abnormal reality is at the hips and the pelvis because we sit a lot. Human beings are not really well designed functionally from a motor from a motor control motor developmental standpoint we're not designed to be sitting right it alters the length of the hip flexors and alters the length of the extensors at the hip this is where assessments come in static postural assessments things like that this is really where that's going to help you um so now we get into a concept called reciprocal inhibition. This is this now is really important, uh, important information that you need to be writing down and and memorizing. Reciprocal inhibition is uh, when an agonist receives a signal to contract, its functional antagonist receives a um, inhibitory signal. So a normal a normal muscular system functions in a way where when one muscle contracts, its antagonist relaxes. Think about that. If, I, if I'm doing a dumbbell curl, I can't have my tricep contracting because it has the exact opposite effect on the elbow, right? It tries to extend it. So in other words, my agonist is not gonna fight my antagonist, right? So when the agonist, when you say, I'm gonna do a dumbbell curl, without you even realizing it, your tricep actually relaxes. You don't have to think about it. Your body takes care of it. Don't worry about it. Your body takes care of it itself. That's called reciprocal inhibition. That means that when the agonist is contracting, the antagonist is relaxing. Now, flip that back around. When I do pushdowns, when I do pushdowns, tricep pushdowns on a machine, what's the agonist? Well, it's the tricep because it's the primary mover for that movement. What's the antagonist? It's the bicep. So when I do a pushdown, right? My biceps go, they go flaccid, they relax, right? To allow for extension of the elbow. But then I do a dumbbell curl and it flips back around. Um, altered reciprocal inhibition, think about that, this term altered. Altered reciprocal inhibition occurs um, when an overactive agonist muscle uh, decreases the neural drive to its functional antagonist. So altered reciprocal inhibition basically says that an agonist like the bicep when it's overactive when it's overactive is sending signals to the antagonist now the muscle is overactive not because you're doing a dumbbell curl that's not why the bicep is overactive it's overactive because of altered length tension relationship because again you're sitting like this all the time and you've shortened you've shortened the muscle for instance or because of the way you're sitting um, or the way you're standing or whatever it is you're doing, those primary movers are, are 
they're contracting, they're, they're overactive, meaning you've got them working too much when they shouldn't be. That's what overactive basically means. They normally shorten, they get overactive and they shorten and they stay like that. Altered reciprocal inhibition then occurs because what is the antagonist gonna do? It's now gonna receive inhib inhibitory neural, neural activation that tells it, you just need to relax. And, but the tricep doesn't wanna do that. The tricep wants to get back to its normal length. The tricep wants to get back to this length. But because of the overactive muscle keeping it like this, this guy now has to lengthen. And because of that, that lengthened muscle becomes weaker, becomes under, underactive. And so there's more, more to come on that. And this causes muscle, this, this occurs because of muscle imbalances when muscles um, on each side of a uh, joint have altered length tension relationships. I, I, I hope that makes, I hope it makes sense. Stretch shortening cycle is another concept um, that you can, you can read through. Again, there's some definitions here that, that you definitely want to look at um, and memorize. So as we move on to force velocity curve, there's this, um, there's a inverse relationship between the amount of force that a muscle can produce and the speed at which it can produce that force. So the faster, the faster the muscle um, shortens, the lower the force output and vice versa. <clears throat> and so that could be a little confusing, but just understand that there is an inverse relationship. If I put a lot of weight and I'm generating a lot of force on my quads because I've got a couple of hundred pounds of weight doing a squat, I can't do it very fast. It's actually going to be a slower movement, but it has greater, greater force output, power potential, and vice versa. Force couple relationships on page um, 211 um, basically talk about how muscles work in conjunction with each other to produce movement on either on on either different sides of the joint or in the case of the scapula, for instance, rotational movement of the scapula. So force couple relationships talk about how, um, how muscles, different muscles on different sides or different areas of a bone, for instance, in this case, the scapula, uh, functionally contract to create movement. And if you look at figure, uh, figure seven, 718, you can see that in the scapula, as you move the arm, as you abduct the arm, the scapula also rotates. Now think about it for a second. In order for the scapula to rotate, you have muscles that are pulling it one way and the opposing, opposing muscles are pulling the other way to create rotation. We call that a force coupling. So force couple relationship. And um, that's important to understand because it occurs, it occurs quite a bit in the upper body in the scapula. The scapula is probably one of the main, now don't get me wrong, the scapula, the pelvis is the same way. There's lots of muscles working on either side, both anterior, posteriorly, right, laterally, medially, that allow for the pelvis to move and shift in different ways. This is caused by force coupling. When, when differing muscles on opposite sides or different areas of the bones or body segments contract simultaneously to create the appropriate movement pattern. <clears throat> and there's a lot of sinking and an appropriate neuro uh, sequencing that must occur for this to happen. Page 212 of uh, muscular systems of the body. This is, this is a concept known as the glo uh, global and local uh, muscle muscular systems. The local uh, muscles are generally those muscles that are attached to the, to the vertebrae, right? And uh, create, create movement of the uh, vertebrae itself and allow for um, isometric contractions of the, of the vertebral column to ensure that other movements can occur. So that's normally what we call the local uh, muscular system. And then there's the global muscular system, which, um, which is broken down into subsystems. Those subsystems are the deep longitudinal subsystem. Um, which basically involves the muscles. And you can see in figure 719 and 720, 
the muscles that are involved. Deep longitudinal, figure 719, and uh, figure 720 is the posterior oblique subsystem, right? Write it down, take one at a time, just look at these, look at the muscles that are involved. Um, you'll be able to mem uh, memorize it. And then figure 721 is the anterior, remember, posterior subsystem, anterior subsystems, those muscles that are involved in, um, in contracting and holding, holding um, the, uh, the skeletal system in place. Lateral subsystem, those are going to be, those are going to be the muscles that, that, are, um, that are located, obviously, on the outside, like the tensor fascia lateral muscle, the TFL. But again, there are, there are a grouping of muscles that you, that you do need to, uh, do need to memorize. And of course, the idea and that last paragraph that, um, that you see on page 215 is subsystem coordination, which allows uh, appropriate uh, appropriate movement of the of the of the body based on whatever the movement pattern needs to be. Muscular leverage and uh, arthro kinematics now brings us into leverage systems, class one, class two, class three, lever systems. Um, you probably learned this when you were when you were in um, high school when you when you did physics, right? Um, high school physics, you would have learned basic you know, basic leverage systems, a class one lever. And, you know, the idea is that look, look through this on page uh, 216. The idea is that the human body, because of joints, is a leverage-based system. And they give you, they give you um, an explanation of each of the different leverage systems at the particular joints. For the most part, the human body is designed um, around basically class three levers. Uh, we see class two levers or second class levers at the ankle and uh, class one levers, which you don't see too much of in the human body, but you do see them um, particularly at the, um, at the neck and head. So leverage systems, they're important to understand, but uh, just read through it. NASM does not give a whole lot of time to it, which tells you, which tells you something. Um, and then the concept of motor behavior. Page 219, here are your definitions, motor behavior, motor control versus motor learning. You got to know the differences between those. Motor control is the, um, is the ability to initiate movement and to control or to, as they say, uh, correct purposeful controlled movements versus motor learning, right? And you got the sidebar definition. Um, it's the use of the processes themselves through practice and experience. So motor learning is something that you help your clients do through the training process. <clears throat> Athletes are constantly going through, hopefully, increased motor learning processes. They get better and better at the particular movements they have to do. So throwing a, throwing a javelin, moving a discus, that involves, that involves motor learning and then, of course, motor development are the, what would be considered sort of the cumulative changes that occur over time through, through motor learning processes. And, um, and so now you have motor control, of course, and you'll get these definitions. Um, table 7.3 muscle synergies. Um, it's not a bad idea to look and understand what the, um, what the synergies are. Now, this is kind of referring back a little bit to what we talked about with the agonist and the synergist and the stabilizers. So when you're doing a squat, what are the what are the agonists? What are the muscles involved with creating the the movement the movement of the uh, of the squat movement itself? It'd be the quads and the the gluteus maximus. Well, what are the synergists? Well, the hamstrings, um, the entire hamstring complex, right? And then the stabilizers are going to be located in the midsection, the core, and the transverse abdominis. And of course, you're getting a couple of exercises. It's a good idea to read through that and kind of get an idea. Not, not a bad idea as well to kind of look at other movements that they do not have down here and kind of figure that out for yourself. So this seated row, the bench press, the shoulder press. Well, think of another exercise kind of uh, like, like, a, um, like a lateral raise. Okay, what would be the muscle synergies in a lateral raise? And so that would be helpful for you to write that down. 
as well. Proprioception is just the ability to know where limbs are, where your body is in time and space. Um, you have special nerves, nerve muscle complexes, right? Located in the joints, inside muscles, in and around the tendons. These are called mechanoreceptors, right? The muscle spindle fibers, which tell the muscle to contract and Golgi tendon organs, which tell the muscle to relax. Those are called mechanoreceptors. You also have uh, mechanoreceptors, which are proprioceptive um, apparati in the joints. So when the joint moves, you know, right? If you close your eyes, you know your elbow is flexing and extending. How do I know that? Well, well, I mean, I know it because two seconds ago I closed my... No, I know it because there's mechanoreceptors in my elbow joint that also along with the other receptors in my biceps and triceps um, are constantly sending, sending feedback to my brain to let me know uh, that's where your elbow is and it's flexing and extending. So that's what proprioception is. This, this allows for the concept of motor learning, um, which is what's going to really define um, how your clients learn and, and deal with the external environment of resistance training, okay? Motor learning is critical. And it's why, again, if you remember what I said at the beginning of the chapter, we're looking, looking ahead. NASM is prepping us, right? Prepping us for understanding why the OPT model was designed the way it was designed. Because you can't take somebody that's never trained with resistance, resistance equipment and just have them doing power cleans and bench presses and squats. That would probably not be the best thing. You'd probably want to move them from um, an initial state of developing isometric contractions in certain muscles, yada, yada, yada. And that's what you're going to, that's what you're going to see later on. Through the textbook, motor learning is the integration of motor control processes with practice and experience, right? So motor learning, and that takes that takes time. And this is what we want to do when we when we start training people. Initially, it provides feedback or it creates feedback internally, and then there's the external feedback. Um, a really important concept here, even though it's at the end, is neuromuscular efficiency when you're dealing with uh, athletes in particular, the goal is to create neuromuscular efficiency so that they get better and better um, at the particular movement patterns that they're trying to trying to develop. Uh, basketball players, you, you've got to shoot hoops. If you're going to shoot and try and get better and better at getting this ball into a hoop, you've got to do it over and over and over, but you've got to create an efficient pattern right? An efficient pattern that can be, quote, locked into place neuromuscularly. That's what neuromuscular efficiency is. Um, instead of, you know, just as an example, instead of flailing your arms around and throwing the, but no, what, what, what's a more neuromuscularly efficient way to get the ball into the hoop? Well, it's keeping the elbows tucked in, getting the proper positioning of the hands, right? And doing a very efficient movement, and as I do it over and over, it's like a swinging a bat, swinging a bat, throwing a ball. You create neuromuscular efficiency. It's as simple as trying to help your clients do step ups, right? They don't have to flail their arms around while they're doing step ups. They create neuromuscular efficiency, right? And just those muscles that are necessary to do the movement. So that moves us, uh, brings us to the end of end of the chapter. Very important chapter. Read your summary your chapter review, go through your chapter highlights. You may need to backtrack a little bit and spend some time, um, uh, particularly on chapter on chapter seven, because there's a lot, in, a lot of meat and potatoes in this one with lots of terms that are going to be very helpful as we, as we move through the rest of the text. So that, um, that concludes chapter seven and uh, look forward to seeing you in chapter eight.